Okay, so your last couple of minutes maybe. All right, so what I'm going to be showing you is a tool that I've been working on for the last year or so that is designed to assist people who want to understand how a client is talking to um, other systems on the network. So it's a demonstration of Mallet, which is act ultimately actually a framework for creating your own proxies. Hands up how many of you have used Burp or Zap or um, Achilles? Anybody going back years and years? Oh, nice, thank you. And Web Scarab? <laughs> One or two. All right. Okay. Um, so obligatory, who are my slide? I work for a company called SensePost. I'm a researcher. Um, I've been with SensePost for eight years. Uh, SensePost was founded in 2001. Uh, so we've been around for a while. I guess everybody around here probably knows who we are. Um, yeah, started in Rulof's bedroom in 2001 on the 14th of February. Trust hackers not to have anything to do on Valentine's Day. Okay, and if you want to get hold of me, that's where you can get hold of me. Okay, so why do we care about flows across a network? The, the essential systems that are interesting communicate, and those communications happen across a network of some description. Um, so a lot of that communication has been done using HTTP and HTTPS because it's, as we like to call it, the universal firewall traversal protocol. Um, but there are a lot of other protocols as well that, that you may encounter. So I think what's, what's been happening in the past is that when people have run into applications that are using non-HTTP or HTTPS protocols, they run Wireshark and they go, yeah, okay, Maybe it's SSL, it's, it's fine, you know, I'm gonna call it good. Um, I don't really know what's going on here because I don't have tools to actually do anything with this data. So the one thing about Wireshark is that you can see what's going across the network, but you can't tamper with it. And this is why things like the intercepting proxies have been so powerful for reviewing web applications. But in many cases, if you can just get into the stream of the communications between the client and the server, um, you can tamper with it in many, uh, in many cases in very similar ways as you would with uh, an HTTP or a web application. Okay, um, and the other thing I just wanted to mention there is that in many cases, when you start looking at non-HTTP applications, uh, it very often takes you right back to the 90s, where we saw things like um, shopping uh, item prices in hidden form fields, um, in shopping carts and that sort of thing that you could just tamper with, set the item to be one cent uh, and check out. Um, because you know nobody's actually looked at these protocols in any detail, um, simply because tools haven't really been available to do that. Okay, so I just want to point out some of the important differences between, or some of the things that make HTTP a more easy protocol to deal with, um, and then contrast that to some of the, the complications that may come up in, in other protocols. So, on the one hand, HTTP is a nice orderly request response based protocol. You send a request, you get a response, and you're done. It's stateless, which means that you can establish a TCP connection, send the request, get your response, disconnect, and open a new connection, and send the next uh, request. So you don't actually maintain any significant state um, on a particular TCP connection, other than if you're doing NTLM, but that's not really important because you can just disconnect and reconnect, uh, and that's, um, that's real, that can be ignored for the purposes of an intercepting proxy. Contrast that to something a little bit less orderly. Uh, for example, OpenSSH. Who talks first? 
when you establish a connection to an SSH server? Does anybody have an idea? Does the client talk first or does the server talk first? Do you get a banner from the server or do you send your request? In fact, they both talk simultaneously. The client doesn't wait for a banner. It starts talking immediately that it connects and the server sends its banner and waits for the client to actually send its own piece of information. So it's a simultaneous connection or simultaneous uh, talking kind of protocol. Just to illustrate that other protocols can be a lot more messy than our nice orderly HTTP that we're all familiar with. Other things that we need to worry about are things like timeouts. How many of you have intercepted a request in Burp, um, you know, shut down your laptop, gone home for the weekend, come back on Monday morning, opened up your, your laptop, gone, oh, yeah, here's this request that I had intercepted, um, send it on or forward the request, and you get a response. No issue. So Burp abstracts things like timeouts and disconnections from the network um, in, a, in a very uh, convenient way. Other protocols may not be that forgiving. Uh, one thing in particular that you have to worry about is timeouts. So if you send a request to an HTTP server, in fact, uh, and you start typing really slowly or you just open a TCP connection, after a few seconds that connection is going to disconnect again. And that's because the server has been um, fitted with some protection against an attack called slow loris, which is a way of um, denying service to an application. You open up lots of TCP connections and um, eventually you can exhaust all the resources of the, of the HTTP server. So if you don't send data, it will disconnect. But you don't see any of this in Burp because you track that connection and you can hold that as long as you like and then send it on and it's just transparent. And this once again is because HTTP is nice and orderly and you can disconnect and the requests are stateless. The timeout happens on the server end, but Burp hasn't actually made a connection to the server until you forward that request and get the response back. Contrast that to a stateless protocol where you have to maintain your connection to the server as, um, continuously. And if you don't respond fast enough, the server is going to disconnect you. So these things can be a lot more difficult to deal with. And particularly in Mallet, I have no, no sort of magic bullet to address timeouts unless you can find things like a, a sort of a keep alive message that you can send. Um, but one thing that Mallet does offer you is the ability to script the changes that you would like to do so that it's not a manual process. Okay, so really just to show um, that there is a lot of complexity in dealing with protocols other than HTTP. Have any, anyone here had to ins or deal with a protocol, um, work with an application that was using a non-HTTP protocol? Can you give me an idea of what the protocol was? AMQP? Queuing protocol. Okay, you were trying to review the security of it or just see how it worked? Okay, all right, um, sure. So I think for a lot of people, they, the solution to dealing with custom protocols is to write your own test bed. You'll you know, hack it up in whatever language you're most comfortable with. It becomes a once-off solution suited for that particular protocol and probably that like one particular environment. Um, and it doesn't become a more general solution to the problem. Ah, uh, come on, really. Got to turn off my uh, screensaver. Okay, um, so a lot of solutions that I've seen uh, have involved people using SOCAT. You, know, you script up something with SOCAT uh, running as a server and you pipe that through a bit of you know, SED or, or AUK or whatever you're going to use to make your manipulations and then back into SOCAT to, to make its ongoing connection. Uh, and again, these are very point solutions that are mostly uncomfortable to use. And so what I was trying to do with Mallet was to provide the infrastructure that is required for all intercepting proxies um, and allow you to focus purely on the, the protocol itself. 
So there is prior work. Um, I wrote OWASP proxy. This is obviously a problem that I've been thinking about for a long time. OWASP proxy I started in 2007, um, but gave up on that fairly quickly when I realized that I was building a programming framework, which doesn't make it easy for a, a tester to actually just get on with dealing with the protocol itself. Um, Martin Holswender wrote Hatkit proxy based on OWASP proxy. Um, it didn't get very much traction again, um, unfortunately. Uh, then there's Mallory. Mallory is probably the most famous of the intercepting proxies. Uh, it was released in 2010, and I think its last update was in 2011. Um, from that, I'm assuming that it wasn't particularly popular. It didn't get very much take up, and I think one of the reasons for that is the complexity, how difficult it actually is to get started with it. So Mallory is shipped as a virtual machine, which means that in order to get traffic into Mallory, you've got to deal with IP tables, rules, and routing configurations. Um, and you know, it, it's just a, it's a lot of overhead to figure out whether you're actually going to be able to use a tool or not. You know, I think a lot of people go, yeah, I'm not even gonna look at that. Uh, and there's a bunch of others. Um, all of these ones with the slashes in are um, GitHub repos. So probably the most famous of the remaining ones that I haven't talked about yet is BetterCap. So I think BetterCap is, is really good um, at very low level protocols, so the ARP poisoning and those sorts of things. But in terms of intercepting arbitrary protocols, the only support that BetterCap actually has is for HTTP and HTTPS. So we're kind of right back where we started. We don't actually have a solution for non-HTTP protocols. Um, so to address the issues that I saw, I wanted to make Mallet as easy as possible to get started with. Um, in contrast to the, the confusion with uh, routings and routing tables and IP tables and so on. And then the other thing that I wanted to do was avoid reinventing the wheel and doing it badly. And I think that's another reason why tools like Mallory didn't get any traction is because they had very limited protocol support. So that if you wanted to support something that wasn't on the list of things that they already provided to you, you had a fair amount of work to do and it was using a sort of custom framework that they had developed. So, as I mentioned, one of the problems that I um, ran into when I was uh, writing OWASP proxy is that I was building a programming framework that would have been very special purpose. You know, the only people who would have known how to use it would have been, you know, I would have had to support every single person who comes in trying to write their own protocol decoder. And then I ran into Netty and I was inspired because the way that it works uh, lines up very nicely with the way I wanted to be able to, um, to make this available to users. So Netty, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is a Java network application programming framework um, designed for, yeah, buzzword compliant, a rapid development of maintainable high performance protocol uh, servers and clients. So they do have HTTP, um, but they've got a vast wealth of other protocols that they also support. Uh, and more importantly, they have a large community of developers who are creating their own protocol implementations and would be in a position to assist anybody who wants to know how to create their own protocol decoders and encoders using the Netty framework. Uh, and just for, uh, for illustration, um, the lead developer of Netty works for Apple. My understanding is that they ship, well, Netty is used to ship in order of four petabytes of data a day using the Netty framework. So it's very high performance. Um, and they've thought about its architecture in a lot of detail. Uh, and that actually makes it really, really nice for my purposes. So this just illustrates a sort of brief overview of um, the Netty architecture. Um, at the bottom layer, they've got their byte buffer, which is their um, abstraction of a byte array. Um, 
a, an extensible event model, which we're going to be using to uh, manage the connections and the messages going backwards and forwards across the connections, uh, and then a bunch of different protocols that they've got implemented. Okay, so a core abstraction for the Neti framework is their um, channel pipeline. Uh, and the channel pipeline is basically a, uh, a holder for a number of channel handlers. And the channel handlers basically implement your protocols. Um, so you'll have data coming in from the network um, at the socket read level. It hits the first inbound handler who might uh, process that data in some way or update a state uh, or something along those lines. Um, forward information onto the next handler and so on and so forth. Uh, it may also choose to uh, write data out to the network as in response. So for example, this might be an SSL handler. So it receives encrypted data and does the sort of handshaking with the uh, SSL server, uh, and then it forwards clear text data on up the channel. Uh, and eventually it's going to get to the top of the channel. Uh, generally that would be an application that is uh, implementing your business logic, um, and that's going to then respond back down the channel um, layering on the different protocol uh, modifications as it goes. So how do you turn this into a proxy? Very simple. Uh, for our business logic, all we do is we implement a relay. So it receives bytes coming in or messages coming out the top of the pipeline and copies them into um, the next outgoing pipeline. Uh, and any messages coming up in the other direction get copied across. Very simple. Um, but very effective. And of course, our relay then uh, has the opportunity to provide information about those messages and about the, the data going through to a user interface that, uh, that we can then interact with those, those messages. <clears throat> so I've mentioned uh, one of the problems with uh, most of the, the intercepting proxies being that you have to uh, deal with IP tables and uh, routing tables and so on. Um, I wanted to avoid that using uh, you know, something that's a lot easier and more familiar for people to get started with. Uh, and that led me to the SOX proxy, the uh, SOX protocol. Um, so the SOX protocol is a fairly well-supported way of establishing TCP connections through a bastion host, so a, an upstream gateway. But of course, it doesn't have to be very far upstream. It can also be running on our local machine. Um, and again, giving us that ability to intercept uh, the data and, and interact with it. <clears throat> and so the simplest, or the sort of, this is the, an example of the standard pipeline that Mallet will start up with. So at the top, we have a um, a listener, and in this case, it's a Java NIO server socket channel. Um, and Neti supports a bunch of different kinds of, of transports, uh, for example, UDP, um, serial connections, SCTP, uh, and so on. Once the data comes in, uh, it'll be passed over to a SOX initializer, and that's really just a sort of a wrapper for a few different protocol handlers that negotiate the SOX protocol with the caller. Uh, and really what that's doing is it's allowing that caller to say, I would like to connect to this IP address on this port. And from there we can then pass that on through the pipeline and make that outbound connection to that, uh, to that destination. And then once that's done, the SOX initializer essentially just gets out of the way. Um, the intercept handler is a like it sounds, it's a way of intercepting the messages that are going through the pipeline, and it presents those in the user interface. The relay just does the copying across from one pipeline to, the, to another, uh, and you can see the different colors here. Uh, the blue color indicates the server side of the connection, and the red color indicates the, the client side of the connection. That's the outbound or outgoing direction. Um, so you may wonder why there are two intercept handlers. Uh, the reason is um, sometimes for debugging purposes, it's handy to see 
that the messages that you're writing or that you're receiving are actually being written out to the server uh, and that the messages that the server is sending are actually being written back out to the client. So it's, it's handy to see uh, both sides of the connections. So in, in a way, it gives you a sort of debugging view of it, which is um, quite useful. Um, <clears throat> so this is the sort of simplified version of a netty channel handler, showing really the, the methods that you may want to implement in your own protocol handlers, um, or just in a sort of scripting fashion if you were uh, looking to do that. So channel active, you might override if you wanted to set up some initial action on, a, on your uh, protocol handler being uh, added to the pipeline. Channel read gets invoked whenever a message comes in from the network, and you've got um, the message object that you can interact with. Channel write, similarly, you, uh, is called when a handler is writing a message back down that pipeline, and again, you've got that message object that you can interact with. And then user event triggered can sometimes be useful for putting logging messages just into that connection data, or just letting you know what's happened. So here is a very simple um, handler or scripting handler. Well, it's a, it's a handler. It can be implemented as a script. Uh, in this case, it is because it's got the sort of return new channel duplex handler at the top, which is just a sort of scripting mechanism. But what it's doing is it's looking for inbound messages, checking to see if it's a text WebSocket frame, extracting the text of that, turning it into an uppercase version and putting a new text WebSocket frame with the uppercase text back into the pipeline. So not particularly useful, but it demonstrates that in a few lines of code, you can make fairly you know, advanced changes to, uh, to messages that are passing through the pipeline, and you can discriminate based on the type of message that it is, however it's been parsed. So I think that's enough talking. Um, what I'd like to do is show a demonstration. Uh, and I didn't bring any children with me, so I can't sacrifice them. <coughs> um, and Fly Safair wouldn't let me bring any chickens on the wing. OK, let's see. Whoops. That is a very strange thing that VMware does. It doesn't lock your screen if your mouse is inside your VMware. Very odd. Okay, I'm just going to see. If I can set this up as a single monitor, because otherwise I'm gonna be breaking my neck to see what's going on. Okay, so Mallet is packaged as a Maven project. So if you clone the repo, simple enough just to run a Maven, oops, Maven clean package. And it'll build it relatively quickly after downloading a few files. You can then just run it as a jar. <coughs> and it will show you something that looks like this. So in the big white area, you've got your standard pipeline, which is that SOX initializer, and it will just forward bytes across, um, and you can start seeing what that traffic looks like. And this is very analogous to looking at it with Wireshark. You can see the bytes going across, uh, but in this case now you can actually start tampering with them as well, should you choose to. Um, and as I mentioned, in order to get traffic to go through Mallet, um, you would need to Soxify it. So Sox is, um, Sox implementation is relatively simple to, to do. Um, a lot of programs already have built-in support for using a Sox proxy. 
Um, but if they don't, you can also use a wrapper program like uh, Soxify, um, ProxyCap, TSOX. Um, there are a bunch of um, apps on Windows. I think, sorry, I mentioned um, ProxyCap uh, is uh, also available on Windows that you can use to specify you know, which particular executable you want to intercept. Uh, so that's a, a nice way of getting Windows traffic into Mallet as well, even if it doesn't have native SOC support. Um, on the left-hand side in the green tabs, you've got uh, a bunch of sort of predefined protocol handlers that are fairly common. Um, in the basic section, you've got sort of Mallet-specific things, such as um, listeners, um, the intercept handlers, and the relays. Um, and the, your sort of SOX proxies and such like, SOX handlers. Um, on the protocols tab, you've got some uh, sort of fairly simple things like SSL servers and SSL clients, uh, HTTP servers, HTTP clients, uh, string decoders, um, JSON decoders, and so forth. Um, and these are just a variety of different protocols that I've run into and needed to support directly. Um, so I've added a shortcut to them. But it's simple enough to add your own protocol support using um, the default handler. If you just drag that, let's make that a bit bigger. If you drag a handler into the user interface, all it's really um, containing is the class name of the handler. So you can change that to a different class, and you can specify um, any parameters that are required for that particular instance, um, uh, constructor parameters for that, for that class name. Um, okay, so what I'm going to demonstrate is a simple client-server application that is packaged with Mallet just for experimentation purposes. So it's a JSON-based protocol um, that receives your first name, surname, and date of birth, sends it off to a server, and gets a response back with your age. So if you go to the Connections tab and select the first connection, um, it, it collects a list of all the events that have passed through, um, including things like the connection establishment, uh, and so on. But the important ones that you're going to be interested in are probably things like um, user event triggered, which is this, this is reported by the SOC server, so trying to connect to this particular address, and then things like the channel read and write events. So here we have a channel read, uh, and you probably can't see it too well, but there is an open curly brace. And if you go down, this is the channel write on the client side, Again, showing that open curly brace going out. And then incoming, um, a line of text, birth year 1972, outgoing, the same, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a list of individual sort of chunks of message that were received on the network. Now, looking at it, uh, it looks again like this is a JSON message, um, but it's not particularly easy to work with because it's fragmented in a number of different pieces. So before we can really start working with this, what we really want to try and do is defragment this message. And an easy way to do that, um, given that this is a JSON object, is to match opening and closing braces. So we can just count up when we get an opening brace and count down when we get a closing brace. And when we get back down to zero, we can pass on that completed message. So let's create a graph that does that, or let's open a graph that does that. And these are all in the examples. So if you want to play around with this in your own time, the client and the server is in the mallet jar. Very simple um, to, to play with. All right, so let's go back to the graph editor and see what's changed. And really all I've done is I've added this JSON object decoder. Now, this isn't a piece of code that I wrote myself. 
this is native Netty functionality. I didn't have to think about this. I just went and looked for Netty JSON protocol support. This, as I show you, is a Netty handler that is existing. So I just dropped it onto the, the line in between the SOX initializer and my intercept handler. Let's go back to the client and send another message. So we have a second connection, but instead of having a bunch of different messages read, there are a bunch of read events for each of those things, but at the end of it, we have a single um, aggregated message showing our entire JSON object. So it's important to be able to, um, to aggregate messages into a single logical thing because you don't really want to be working with just an open brace. Okay, so this is all very well. We've now um, managed to uh, figure out where our message starts and ends, but you don't really want to be fiddling with bytes when you're dealing with a text-based protocol like JSON. So let's go back to our graph editor and open our next example. All right, so what we've done here is added a, um, two new channel handlers, a string decoder and a string encoder. And what these are going to do is they're going to take bytes in and they're going to emit a string object, a Java string object. Um, and in the outbound direction, it's going to take a string coming in and, or a string going out, should I say, and emit a sequence of bytes. And we've parameterized this by telling it to treat them as UTF-8 strings. Because once again, this is um, a Netty handler. This is not my own code. This is built-in Netty functionality that supports a variety of different character sets. All right, once more. So now we have a new connection, but we can see that rather than a sequence of bytes, we've now translated it into something that's a bit more usable. So we've now got a text, uh, a string object, that we can edit. Um, and while we could have edited it um, as the bytes, the, the, byte, um, the byte viewer does allow you to modify those bytes as well if you intercept the messages. As I said, it's not that friendly. So at this point, I'm going to demonstrate that you can now intercept these messages and, um, and, mo and modify them. All right, so instead of an immediate response, we now see that we have um, a few events which have been um, caught and held. We can send the initial connect on and it starts doing its protocol handling. And here is a message which has been sent by the client, foobarbaz. And I can now send that on and I'm going to turn off intercept because it does generate lots of different messages. Um, but you can see that the message that was sent out was Baz rather than Foo, and if I go to my server instance, it received a last name of Baz instead of Bar. Okay. Sorry, they, whoever's parked on the sports field that you need to move your car, sorry, real quick. <laughs> Lots of people have parked there, it seems. Okay. All right, so the, um, the next step, using a string is all very well but um, maybe we'd actually rather parse this into something that is uh, a bit more useful to work with, something like a structured JSON object. So in this case, I've created a script handler, which is going to make use of the Jackson 
um, library, a Jackson uh, Java JSON API. And basically what I'm doing is I'm making use of, I'm extending existing native functionality um, and implementing an encode and decode method. My decode method is going to take in a byte buff and emit JSON node objects. Um, and yeah, that's just a couple of lines to do that. Uh, and then similarly in the encode, I'm going to take in a JSON node and emit it as bytes again. Sending the message to the server. And now you can see that instead of a string, we've now got a structured object. Um, and this introduces another feature of Mallet, which is the ability to edit arbitrary Java objects using reflection. So reflection just allows you to interrogate the properties of an object and to view its fields um, and to drill down into those. So you don't have to create a special editor for every kind of data type, although it can make your life a little bit easier in some cases. Okay, so that's not intercepted, so I can't tamper with it, but let's run that again. So for example, if I change that to 1962, I can send that on. And it thinks I'm now 56 years old. Okay, so this is now showing that you can interact with all sorts of different kinds of objects. Mallet doesn't actually care what type of object you're passing across, so long as it knows in some way, or you tell it, how to convert that object back to a stream of bytes. And really this is what understanding a protocol comes down to. You understand how to make sense of a sequence of bytes, turn it into something usable, and then turn that back into a sequence of bytes in some way or other. I added them. It's been since I've had uh, my twins. Okay, so the one thing I'd like to point out now, though, is that there's this checksum invalid uh, message that, uh, that's coming up when I tamper with a message. And if you look at the message itself, there is the checksum field. And after doing a bit of reverse engineering, it looks like this is an MD5 sum of the first name, surname, and year. So that's protocol understanding 101 eventually. Okay, so in order to allow us to make modifications and send them onto the server without the server realizing that this message is now inconsistent, we're going to have to make sure to update this checksum field. And it may be that you're making some changes to a different type of object that doesn't have a checksum, but it has other fields that refer to the thing that you've changed and they need to remain consistent in some way. So let's go back to our um, last graph. And I've added another script handler on the outbound pipeline that will recalculate the checksum for me. So instead of me having to go to my shell and pass these things through MD5sum, I have a script which will do this for me automatically uh, on every single message. So on a write event, if it is a JSON object, it will get the name, surname, and year, calculate the MD5 sum of that, and then it will update the node to put that MD5 sum in the right place. So 
So one last time. Ah, I need to intercept this. And it returns an answer, but more importantly, the server doesn't care. It can't tell that I've been tampering with it. Okay, so I hope you can see the progression from starting to understand what the protocol looks like, what the data you, that you're seeing goes through. Just bytes on a line, um, then we start saying, okay, well, it's JSON, so we'll aggregate that into a, into a JSON object, um, make it something a bit more useful to deal with, uh, and now starting to automate some of the changes that we might want to make to those objects. Um, and, and how relatively easy this is to, to do. Okay, I've got a few other demonstrations that I'd like to show you um, to illustrate that Mallet can actually do some fairly complex things. So this is illustrating two sides of, of, of Mallet. So on the left-hand side, there is an HTTP pipeline. Uh, and on the right-hand side, there is a UDP pipeline. Um, what's going on, just to, to work sort of down the, the graph, we get our SOX connection coming in. It looks to see whether it is HTTP, whether it is SSL or not. If it is SSL, it adds an SSL server handler. Mallet will automatically generate certificates for you, uh, signed by a CA, much like Burp does. Um, uh, and then um, negotiate that, um, that connection for you. Any bytes that come through, it will make a, a, another check to see if it looks like an HTTP request. So if the first few bytes look like a get, head, post uh, request, then it will go down the HTTP branch or else it will take the non-HTTP branch. If it is an HTTP request, uh, and you can see the same sorts of things happening down this HTTP branch for the non-SSL option as well. So if it is HTTP, we'll use an HTTP server codec, so it reads in a, a GET request, for example, um, and knows how to encode an HTTP 200 response back into bytes. Um, because, Mallet, uh, because Netty is designed for high performance, um, it actually deals in HTTP requests as chunks. So you've got the request header and then chunks of message um, content. We don't really want to deal with chunks of content, so we have an aggregator that just pulls those content uh, chunks back into a single message. Um, further down, we have a special handler that I wrote um, to handle the upgrade process from an HTTP request, from an HTTP protocol, to the WebSockets protocol. So WebSockets is a protocol that runs on top of HTTP, but really, in fact, what's happening is that the endpoints tell HTTP to get out of the way and convert that connection just to a pure TCP connection um, without the overhead of the HTTP messages. Uh, and so that's what that WebSocket upgrade handler is doing. It's listening for the successful upgrade message and then removing those HTTP handlers. Um, and then I have a script handler which will make WebSocket frames uppercase. So just to do a couple of quick demonstrations because I know I'm running out of time. Um, WSCAT is a WebSockets client. So I'm running that. Oh, uh, network disconnected.
uh, disconnected. All right, having networking problems. Um, so, right, what I would demonstrate there is really that um, if you send that WebSocket message, it gets uppercase and the response comes back uh, in uppercase. Aha, there we go. Normally, if you run it without going through the proxy, you just get back exactly what you sent. The other one I wanted to demonstrate was um, a UDP pipeline. So in this case, down on the right-hand side, we have a UDP listener that is establishing a DNS pipeline. So it's processing DNS, datagram, DNS query decoders, bytes get decoded, come out as a DNS message, um, intercepted, uh, and then there's a script handler that's really just going to replace any queries for google.com with a query for sensepost.com. Now, for DNS, it's not quite so easy. SOX does support UDP, but it's not quite as simple as just uh, proxy changing it. So you can see I did a dig, redirecting it through port 1053, which is where my UDP listener is, for google.com, but I got back an answer of sensepost.com. In order to do so, I had to write a little bit of a handler that said, if I see this message, change the, um, change the text from google.com to sensepost.com, but I also had to modify the response to make sure that it matched up, because otherwise the dig client would say, hey, I'm getting a response for sensepost, um, while I asked for Google, this is an invalid answer. So Mallet doesn't stop you from having to understand the protocol details. What it does stop you from having to do is re-implement the user interface and a lot of the, the decoders and encoders that convert messages to bytes and bytes to messages. And I think I'm out of time. Any questions? One, one question. How would you prevent this? Like, you have to encrypt the protocol? So an encrypted protocol would be a way of starting to encrypt this, uh, starting to prevent this. Um, much like we see SSL is interceptable using a burp uh, for HTTP, uh, if I control the client, I can tell it to accept my certificate authority. So that sort of thing doesn't necessarily solve the problem. Um, how you would prevent this is using robust check, um, checks and validations on your, on your server to make sure that your client is actually sending you correct data. And the point of Mallet is to allow you to make sure that those things are happening.